Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabori here. As I continue reviewing the Karate Kid movie franchise, and this is where the series went downhill from there, I'm going to review the Karate Kid Part 3, which in the third sequel, in the returning of John Kreese, he joins in with the help of his best friend, Terry Silver, to gain revenge on Daniel Son and Mr. Miyagi by hiring a ruthless martial artist and harming their relationship together. Yeah. Meanwhile, they're both starting the, the bonsai tree uh, business by opening their shop. Yeah. And of course, they're going to start a new tournament and even a love interest and all of this going around it just felt completely flat well they did brought back the writer Robert Mark Kamen along with director John G. Alverson brought back the, the composer Bill Conti I mean Columbia Pictures obviously wanted to do a third installment because they were desperate to have a summer release. I mean, with Batman becoming the biggest hit of them all, same goes with Lethal Weapon 2. I mean, they brought in Ghostbusters 2 to join in, and then they wanted other films. So that way they can compete and become more successful. Unfortunately, the film wasn't exactly as successful as the first two films were. And the main reason why it got made is, again, because the second movie, particularly, was the highest grossing film to date. And they figured if maybe they were going to go for the next uh, beginning where it leads off, well, they figured this is exactly what they were about to do. But it just feels like it was not needed, or perhaps you could pretty much tell that Ralph Macchio doesn't even want to do this anymore. The fact that he's getting tired of it, you can pretty much tell. And it's also getting to the point where it's just becoming more of a poor imitation of the first movie. Because now um, his character changes when he was already stronger enough as it is. That's what's wrong. However, the main focus of the entire movie, though, is that we got Thomas Ian Griffin in his film debut. And he's the movie's saving grace because he's the one that plays Terry Silver. Yeah, a guy who's just over the top, hammered it up, has a, a, has a ponytail on the back. And he's just um, very vicious. I mean, coming up with all these uh, karate skills. The same way that John Kreese had taught. Because they're best friends, you know, and he's a wealthy businessman. That he just come here to save the day to actually hire a, a karate student to actually do all these crazy, insane moves. But this guy can steal a lot of scenes, and that's where this movie became completely watchable. And as for the new love interest um, named Jessica, played by Robin Lively, the same actress who was in Wildcats with Goldie Hawn. She was also in the movie Teen Witch, came out the same year as this movie. Well, she is very sweet and cute, and she's very talented, but sad to say, she sparks no chemistry with Ralph Macchio. In fact, she was underage, and Macchio is older. He was pushing 30. You know, he was only 27 at the time, and, and Robin Lively was only 16. So they had to change uh, the script in order to make them look more like like they were just friends simply 
So there's no kissing scenes together except maybe just kiss on the forehead. Um, so that's so that's why they couldn't um, be written that way. And and his character was 18 years old though. So that that was the problem. But nevertheless, I mean this is exactly what we have to go for. She's obviously no uh, Ali. They should have brought her back though. But I I understand. You know she had to move on. And and I, and that's the problem because if they did brought her back, you know I think this would have helped the the story flow better. But I think another reason they could have made this story a whole lot better if they didn't have to be the tournaments. It could have just been something else. Why couldn't it just be um, I don't know street fighting or something? Or perhaps um, any other. Didn't have to be uh, the tournaments. Because that's the problem. The hell, why can't it just be the the Copa Kai karate class instead? You know, they almost got uh, a bit of the climax there too. In, in that particular dark scene. But I know. And it kind of ruins uh, the relationship between Daniel San and and Mr. Miyagi too. I mean, they were the best things about the first and second film together. We're going to get to more of that uh, when I start this review. And here we go. Stars Rock Machio, Nobuyuki Pat Morita, Robin Lively, Thomas Ian Griffin, Martin Cove, Sean Cannon, Jonathan Aberson. I'm not so sure if that's actually the son of of the director, but it's possible. Uh, Randy Heller, Pat E. Johnson, Rick Hurst, Francis Bay, Joseph E. Perry, Jan Trishka, Glenn Madaros, he's a singer, and Gabriel Jaretz. It's written by Robert Mark Common, and it's directed by John G. Alverson. The movie begins uh, following all the flashback scenes of the first two films. I mean, especially when it got to uh, Karate Kid Part 2. Yeah, it does make you want to watch the first two films again. I, I only wish they had put in um, some more flashback scenes of Part 2 when both uh, Daniel Son and Mr. Miyagi... Um, were together and you saw train scenes and then you saw the moments between him and Kamiko. Could have been more of that. Yeah. Anyway, by September 1985 in Los Angeles, the former sensei of John Kreese of Koba Kai Dojo, who's played by Martin Cove, businesses Vietnam War comrade Terry Silver, played by Thomas Ian Griffin, is a wealthy businessman who founded the Copa Kai and now owns a toxic waste disposable business. So he vows to help him get revenge on Daniel Son and Mr. Miyagi by reestablishing Copa Kai's uh, karate class because um, there wasn't any students available. Um, he did receive uh, a message so hoping that there's a way that they'll, they'll start a tournament that's going to happen. And because of that, um, Silver actually sent Crease uh, on vacation in Tahiti so he could rest and recuperate. Upon returning to Los Angeles, uh, California from Okinawa, Japan, Daniel San and Mr. Miyagi, uh, both played by Rob Machio and Nobuyuki Pamarita, discovers that the South Seas apartment complex is being we developed. Yeah, so they had to do some changes, they had to fix everything. And it only leaves um, Miyagi unemployed and Daniel San homeless. Also, Daniel San's mother Lucille, played by yeah, played by Randy Heller, yeah, she returns in the third film, but only for just a brief scene. Um, she's in New Jersey taking care of Daniel's ill uncle, as you can tell. 
so that way he won't be able to come back and be able to see what's going on here. So at that rate, Miyagi invites Daniel to stay at his house for a while. And Daniel decided to use his college funds that he had to save. Because if you saw in the part two, I mean, Miyagi gave him the money for college education. But he figures that he's going to use the money anyway to form a flower business shop called the, the Bonsai Tree Shop. So that way they can go around selling bonsai trees. Um, if you go back to the first movie though, uh, they they actually started treating and cutting some bonsai trees um, that Miyagi has inside his basement. And of course Daniel Sun was also helping out too in that scene. Okay. Um, so as a thanks, um, Miyagi makes him a partner of the business. And then suddenly Daniel's son had visits um, a pottery store across the street. Yeah. It's actually right in, in the middle of where the, uh, the train actually arrives. He meets um, a girl, a redhead named Jessica Andrews, played by Robin Lively. And eventually... He had a crush on her, just like how he had a crush on Ali in the first movie and Kamiko in the second movie. And I keep going back and forth. <laughs> but she also tells him that she does have a boyfriend that's back home in Columbus, Ohio, so they have to remain themselves friends. Uh, meanwhile, Terry had hired Mike Barnes, who's known as karate's bad boy because he's a vicious karate prospect to actually challenge uh, Daniel Son to the upcoming All Valley Karate Tournament in Reseda. So what does Terry do? He sneaks into Miyagi's house to gather some information and overhears Daniel telling Miyagi that he will not defend his title at the tournament. Yeah, he was going to sign up for it, but it but he decided to change his mind so he could just focus more on the bonsai tree business. So then Barnes and his henchmen harassed Daniel Son by attempt to court him to enter the tournament. And Daniel Son refuses, and Barnes had departs in a rage. Yeah, just when both uh, him and and Jessica were just uh, discussing, they're just having a date, a little date. By the next morning, uh, Daniel Son and Miyagi are practicing kata, which means form, of course. You know, they're just uh, going around training the martial arts with uh, the Japanese swords, you know. But Silver interrupts and lies about John Kreese, thinking that he, he suffers a fatal heart attack after losing his students. But he begs for forgiveness for his behavior and both Barnes and his henchmen return to make uh, Daniel sign up for the tournament. But he again refuses, which that also leads to what happened uh, later on when um, Daniel Son was, was about to take Jessica all the way down to the cliff so that way he can be able to take out all these uh, bonsai trees to put on the bag, hoping to find one that would be good enough for it be able to put it inside the pottery but then both Barnes along with his henchmen just came by was ready to actually drop both Daniel's son and Jessica through the rope if they forced them not to sign for the tournament and yeah so they almost got killed but he figures that if um, he doesn't sign, yes, they're going to drop him. So he decided he'll just do it anyway. And But he was also afraid that they're going to destroy uh, the bonsai tree. Yeah, because they stole it. And then he's telling them, don't. Don't, don't hurt this tree. Just, I, I gave you the, the paper already to sign for the tournament. Just don't hurt it. 
and let, let us go. But Barnes just uh, broke apart the tree, and and, the, and both of them were just um, already safe. They didn't they didn't fell off, and now they had to find a way to actually put it back together, which is not going to be easy. Or or maybe it will because you know they they have some special roots to fix it. I mean Miyagi is going to try to see what's best to to help um, the tree grow. Of course because they had to replace all the missing trees that they got even though they were selling a bunch uh, at his offer. Through, through the course of the uh, the training because um, Mr. Miyagi refused uh, Daniel Song to train at all and he didn't want him to enter the tournament but he just had no choice so they decided uh, they're just gonna move on for, for right now or try to hide them behind their backs by having the Daniel Song train with uh, Terry and Terry however just goes around training him to become the ultimate fighter and all these um, karate skills are as vicious as ever it's really you know very tough very insane and and it just becomes more powerful than ever but it does cause Daniel Son to have many uh, cuts and bruises of sorts but he tries to hide it out however Mr. Miyagi found out about it and then even though he had Daniel Son had to lie because he was just practicing his own training and stuff but then um, Mr. Miyagi had gave him a special uh, medicine that will heal his wounds you know just put some of that uh, you know, powder into the bucket so he'll heal and he's been using that too to heal all of his wounds. Then there was a party that was going around. I, I think it was a senior prom, where this time Daniel Son had to invite uh, Jessica to go around. You know, they're just going around dancing. Yeah, that's where you meet uh, the singer Glenn Arthur Rose. And so it's all the dance music and everything they have until suddenly um, a guy butt in and, and starts to um, attack Daniel and then next thing you know he punches him very strong too yeah he actually breaks his nose completely so then and he's very shocked about his aggressive behavior yet yeah, cuz Daniel was starting to change completely I mean, he started to become more of a wimp, and then even worse, you know, he became more aggressive, he became, you know, high-strong, he, he wasn't exactly himself, so he, he lost his, his strength, his confidence, his mind, everything. All this pressure just went back at him. So because of that, he did apologize and make amends with Jessica and Miyagi for, for what he was becoming. Um, therefore, he did visit uh, Terry to inform him that he will not compete at the tournament at all. And then that's where he reveals his true agenda to him as Barnes suddenly enters the dojo. And, as a surprise, Kreese actually returns. So it's free against one until Miyagi came to save his life. And that's where we get to see Miyagi uh, fight against all three of them, yeah, including uh, Terry. I mean, he, he was really enjoying this. This is where they're going to start going back to training again. And once Daniel Son begins training with uh, Mr. Miyagi helping aside, uh, they, brought, they took out the, the bonsai tree, already have grown roots staying strong and now they put it back into the cliff where it belongs by the time we get to the tournament that's where Barnes reaches the final round to challenge Daniel Son with Silver and Kreese uh, instructed Barnes to inflict serious damage on him 
was trying to keep the score tie, and actually finally beat him in the sudden death. And Barnes actually gave the upper hand during the fight, which causes Daniel Son to relentlessly um, went down, and this is where he's he starts to whine to Mr. Miyagi, saying, "I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, please, I." I I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I, I lost my confidence there and everything. I, I can't do this anymore, but then, well, Miyagi helped him out, and then that's when he finally gained his uh, strength and his um, emotions, his, his uh, focus, his mind, everything. Now he's going back to finally defeat Barnes, and then he finally won. Wasn't an easy task, but he had to do what he can, and that's when the film ends. Completely disappointment of the sequel, and it's no doubt about it, it's the worst. But <coughs> <coughs> that's nothing compared to uh, the next Karate Kid, because we're going to get to that one. And I'm sorry I cough. Um, that's the problem. Um, Ralph Macchio, of course, already pushing 30 at the time. His character starts to change completely. He isn't exactly himself uh, compared to the first two films. And that's the problem. It's like he changes his behavior aggressively and emotionally, phreatically. He started to become a jerk. And... And that's what sucks about that, because I liked him better when he was strong, likable, and charming. And he tries to do that, too. Um, especially when he was with um, his new love interest, um, Jessica. So there were some sweet moments. So there were some sweet moments here and there, you know, for example, you know, they were, they were jogging together. And... And just hanging around for a while. Um, unfortunately, though, there was no chemistry. I, I, she was pretty pointless. She didn't even show up during the tournament, so he figures, you know, what's the point? And I think that was the problem. To me, I, I, I like the the love scenes better in the first two films. That that handled way better. I mean, you couldn't forget those moments in those films compared to this. Uh, Miyagi, <clears throat> uh, Pat Morita, as usual, excellent as Mr. Miyagi. And it's great that we got to see him doing that uh, fight scene against these three. I mean, of course, Martin Cove returning. He doesn't have enough screen time, sadly. I wish he did. But I understand. Because he actually had some scheduling conflicts to, yeah, aired on CBS called Hard Time on Planet Earth. So it's a TV series, uh, but it didn't last that long. So that's why. The violence in the movie were brutal and intense um, by comparison with the first two films, because you know there were some blood here and there, um, but it's as mild as it could be. This one is as mild, but it's almost getting to the point where it's getting more harder. I mean, the scenes where Danielson had to punch uh, for all these uh, practice scenes here and there, you know, trying to pretend like this is the component, and he had to keep punching so hard, you know, with this uh, block of um, wood of, of a dummy, so he had to keep hitting it as hard, you know, almost causing to to break his fist a little bit, so there's like cuts and bruises there, blood, um, fractures his, his knee or leg at times, and, and the fact that he punches so hard on that one guy, breaks his nose, I mean, very strong, that he ran away with Terry, and <sighs> some of those other scenes here was really going for it. But now you know why, you know, Copa Kai these days have one of the strongest uh, 
skills. As for um, the character uh, Mark Barnes, um, eh, not as good as Johnny Lawrence, that's for sure. The best part of the whole entire film is indeed Thomas Ian Griffin. His performance was incredibly, just insanely amazing. And really awesome too, actually. I mean, this is the guy, even though he is the villain, and definitely the best villain we ever got for the film, I mean, he's, he's definitely one tough, uh, he is really one tough uh, instructor and businessman. But he, he, he was like having fun. He really was. I mean, he's incredibly, insanely crazy. I mean, he, he really uh, loves to do this. He, he really wants to defeat uh, Daniel Son or any other. I mean, he wants, to, he wants to go over the top. He wants to be, you know, big. And if it wasn't for him, though, the film would have been basically, you know, a tremendous bore. And apparently that's how it went for it. Um, so you got to give credit to him. I mean, and he's a great actor, too. I mean, he went on to do the film Excessive Force um, in 1993. Excellent film, too. And he went on to do other movies, too. But if, again, if it wasn't for him, the movie would just be a joke. Um, so, and it's nice to see Randy Heller again uh, reprising, but sadly we only get to see her in a small role, but the film kind of drags a bit too um, for its pacing. I mean, the writing isn't exactly as, as smooth as, as it was for the first two films, so I could see why it had its problems. And even though this is indeed the late 80s, I mean, of course we're going to have a lot of that. Um, apparently, um, yeah, it, it didn't do very well at the box office. Only grossed $39 million out of its uh, small budget. Um, I mean it did it did one up to it but it wasn't exactly as huge as the first two films so that's why. And not only that but it's been nominated for Razzies. This is the first movie to be nominated that way and unfortunately they lost. <laughs> Um, but, I, I, which I, I don't get either, too, because, um, why would Pat Morita be nominated? He was great, as excellent as he could be. Um, Mark Macho, on the other hand, yeah, he does eventually give the worst performance, sadly. I mean, considering he was excellent in the first two films, and that's just what's sad about that. But... And the screenplay just wasn't what it is. But yes, even Alberson himself, you know, when he was still alive, I mean, he did call it a poor imitation of the first film, movie. And what's worse, he even says it's a horrible one. So, I had to agree with him on that. Because it is a horrible one, but it's not exactly as horrible as it could be. It just, it just could have been better than this. That's why. Um... The soundtrack, give or take, I mean, there's some good songs, but none of them seem pretty memorable. I mean, it didn't have that most memorable track that the second movie had, and same goes with the first film. Um, the score was there, though, by Bill Conti, so some of it is still familiar. But otherwise, um, it's just what it is. And, and it kind of got boring after a while so but I guess for uh, <laughs> Toby but I guess for this story alone it, it's basically the Terry Silver story you know the first movie is is Daniel Son's story 
The second movie being Mr. Miyagi's story, and the third one being Terry Silver. <laughs> because he really, he made it up for it. He, he stole a lot of scenes. And I mean a lot of scenes. And he, he was really chewing it up. You know, completely. Uh, so that's why you love him. <laughs> So, I mean, for him alone, that's what made the film watchable. But, other than that, though, the sequel blows. Incredibly blows. So, that's The Karate Kid Part 3, and I give the film, just for the sake of it, two stars. Because of Terry Silver's... Uh, over the top performance and in spite of being pointless um, I, I guess I didn't mind a little bit of Robin Lively and well maybe a few things here but otherwise it's just it's the weakest it's the weakest of the bunch it just just went downhill from there I mean, it should have just ended with the first two films. That's all. Anyway. I'm Justin Ray Sabora. We'll stay tuned for the next Karate Kid. Because that one's going to be much worse than this one. Bye.